So welcome back everyone to the Education Summit. I'm Charlie Fitzpatrick and I get to be your uh, convener for the, this particular session, The Power of Focus, Projects Across Space and Time. We've got three sessions each, or three present presentations, each presenter will have about 10 minutes to give a little spiel, and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So if you can go ahead and type your questions into the chat during the session, that's going to make the, our Q&A time all the better. So we've got three presenters and we're going in sequence, as you see here, Kirby Alexander from Texas Christian University, followed by Tom Hammond from Lehigh University, and then Bronwyn Terrell, who is a dual scholar here uh, at the uh, Cedar Road Elementary and at, let's see, William and Mary in uh, Virginia. So let's see if we can push this forward. Starting us out, uh, Kirby Alexander with Terrapin Crossover, bringing a longitudinal study of urban turtles into ArcGIS. And Kirby, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can begin. All right, thank you so much. I'm gonna go ahead and get my, my slides up here. Thank you all for uh, being here today. I hope you can hear me okay uh, and see me. You, you can tell that I'm outdoors. Uh, I am uh, pulling double duty as a um, as a chaperone at my son's scout camp. So I'm coming to you from Worth Ranch in Mineral Wells, Texas. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about a study uh, that's actually being done by a teacher in our in our grant that we're that we've been working on this last year. Um, his name is Andrew Brinker. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He couldn't join us today, um, but I'm going to talk about um, his project and talk about kind of how we brought that project into ArcGIS and the plans that we have moving forward. Uh, so we've called it Terrapin Crossover. So this is a, a study that Andrew has uh, done for the last about four years. And he started in 2017. It's called the, Tr the Trinity River Turtle Survey. Um, the point of the project is to um, basically get citizen scientists, students, community members, other teachers involved in um, surveying and doing an inventory of uh, the population of native turtles in the Trinity River. So the Trinity River, if you're familiar with Texas geography, um, it splits um, a little bit above Dallas and Fort Worth. Uh, one branch of it goes through Fort Worth, one branch goes through Dallas, and then it comes back together later. Um, and so uh, in the Clear Fork uh, branch of the Trinity River that goes through Fort Worth, it's pretty close to his high school. He's a, um, a environmental science teacher at Pascal High School in Fort Worth. Um, and uh, they're looking at native Texas turtle species and just kind of see how they're doing. Are the population, you know, is the population staying steady? Is it rising? Is it dropping? Uh, mainly because of all the urban development that's been going on around the river, you know, both um, industrial projects um, and residential building that's been going on. Uh, so every month they would go down, uh, find different access points. They would trap turtles. They would collect data on them, such as um, weight, um, length. They would, you know, measure their shells. They would tag them. They would even do some um, uh, samples of from the shell looking at diatoms um, to see you know if that was an indicator of water quality uh, mercury concentrations and that kind of thing and so uh, when we were looking for partners uh, for this project that we knew was going to be lasting for four years you know the obvious uh, choice for us was to pick a school that's close to our campus at TCU um, and to pick teachers that we've worked with before so Andrew fit both of those categories uh, and so it made sense initially just to see if there were ways to take work that he had already been doing and fit that into some of the goals for our uh, for our grant. Uh, as you'll probably hear multiple times today because of uh, the more than one of the pres presentations aligns with uh, this project. Uh, what we're doing is having teachers do what we call socio environmental science investigations. 
And so looking at the intersection between society, the environment, um, and not always just um, natural science, but sometimes the social science involved um, um, in those intersections. So this was a natural fit. Uh, so the first thing that we did was, you know, Andrew in, uh, indicated to us that he had uh, about four years worth of data in a spreadsheet. And of course, you know, for any, any uh, GIS person worth their salt, right, you're going to be very excited to hear that. Um, and so uh, he gives us the spreadsheet. And as, as you can see on the left, this was the format that all of the GPS data was in. So the, the first step really, which uh, was probably more the result of, of Tom's, uh, Tom Hammond's expertise with Excel was to find a way to convert, I believe it was 1200 geolocations um, in this spreadsheet into a format that could be read by ArcGIS online. So Tom did some uh, Excel wizardry with, uh, with calculations and um, formulas and functions. And uh, you can see there on the right, that's what we were able to, to, to create as the output. So you've got, you know, columns and columns and columns of, of data, everything you wanna know about native Texas turtles, um, many of which have been caught multiple times, which makes it a longitudinal study. Um, but you know, then you've got to put the data in a format that actually works. And so uh, that's what you see here. And uh, so the first thing that we noticed right away from this data was that it was actually creating better visualization um, of the, the placement of the turtles. Uh, you know, where, we're where they were being found, where they were being trapped uh, and that kind of thing. So what you can see here in the first map on the, on the left is um, every single data point uh, that was collected over, over three or four years of this study. And uh, what you can't really see from, from this uh, version of the map is that some of those dots represent multiple turtles because the geolocation was exactly the same. And so, you know, if you're familiar with ArcGIS online, uh, the pop-up when, when it comes up, you have the ability to navigate through many different data fields um, because it might represent more than one um, record. And that was, that's what was going on here. Um, and this doesn't necessarily represent um, where all of the turtles are. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're necessarily concentrated. You know, the heat map that you see on the right uh, gives a little bit indication of where the most of the activity was happening. Uh, because uh, most likely these were the places where the traps were set. This is the place, the places that had the best access to the river. Um, in some cases, if you were to look closely, it's the places along the river that have the best parking, right? Um, so uh, sometimes when you see data like this, it's an indication of what's going on in nature. Sometimes when you say data like this, it's an indication of what's going on with the people who are uh, collecting information about nature. Um, and so there's a little bit of both going on here. Uh, but you can see the heat map and you can, uh, it gave a really good picture of where the activity is happening. Um, and it allows uh, for Andrew and his students to ask other types of questions. You know, is there uh, any kind of correlation between where people are most likely to access the river and where they're gonna see turtles? You know, maybe the, the best place to find turtles is where is not where we're accessing the river and things like that. So that was kind of the first, uh, the first outcome is that it just created a really, a really nice visual. Uh, the intent uh, for year one, because Andrew already had a really great project in place, was then to move this into a collector. So you can see here, we've got a collector. Um, I will confess to the group, I'm not uh, ashamed to admit this, that the collector you're looking at is not um, for this actual study. Uh, because of COVID, we never actually got there. You know, there weren't students in the building. Um, so there was really, uh, there was really no way, no capacity to do this in a structured way that, that Andrew wanted to. Uh, the collector you're looking at actually is one that Tom and I created really just as practice on where to find the best tacos in Fort Worth. You know, so if you come to Fort Worth, the first thing you want to look for are turtles. The second thing you'll probably want to look for is tacos, um, which is, might be another great study. So that's, we, we want to create a collector um, that's going to streamline this process uh, because what we found is you know for one thing writing you know what, what he had Andrew was doing was having the students open the the compass app on their phone and then basically just write down on a piece of paper their coordinates 
well, you know, when that kind of thing happens, there's some, there's some room for error. You know, what if you leave out a, a, a number, if you switch some numbers, um, you know, you forget to put, uh, you know, north or west or whatever, you know, some of that you can kind of figure out, you know, you kind of know where you are, so you can, you can impute some of that information. Uh, but this just makes things a lot more streamlined. Uh, as part of the grant, we were able to buy GPS enabled iPads. So um, no matter where they are, uh, even if there's no Wi-Fi, uh, the uh, GPS chip will be able to detect where they are so they can use the collector, uh, which is now uh, field maps uh, to, um, to automatically Im input that data um, they can include things like pictures and things like that. So sorry, I'm getting bit by ants as I sit here, you know, the dangers of presenting from scout camp. So let me move on to my, my next screen. You know, so some of the things we, we learned from this, well, first of all, you know, the big lesson for us, and this is probably the lesson that everybody's learned about everything, is that, you know, the COVID-19 restrictions uh, changed the project. And it wasn't just the restrictions, uh, it was the uh, the way that COVID-19 changed uh, school attendance. Uh, in Fort Worth ISD, they gave students the option to either have school in person or to, to uh, learn from home remotely. Uh, and so teachers, in many cases, would be delivering instruction uh, to students in both places. They'd have students in class and students um, at home. Uh, and because there were students not coming to school, it really made it uh, impossible even if they were able to get field maps on their phone or something easy like survey one, two, three, which is a lot easier to build, a lot easier to deploy um, on uh, individual like personalized devices because it just runs through your browser. Um, even with that, you know, you're, there's, some, there's some things that are tricky. I mean, do you want students messing around with, with, with wild turtles without someone there to help with it, right? And so you really want the teacher to be there overseeing that project because you want to protect the wildlife um, and make sure that they're being handled in a way that's, you know, that's, that's safe for everybody. Um, so it really changed the project. Uh, so when we wrote the proposal, we weren't really sure where things were going to be. You know, now looking back, we know that we weren't able to fully to do this the way we wanted to in, in year one. So it gives us a lot to look forward to in year two. Um, um, the other thing is, even if the students that came to campus um, were able to do this project, the school district was not letting teachers leave campus um, with students as they normally would. So Andrew, who's you know been at the school for you know close to 15 years, has a lot of uh, trust with the administrators. Is this has been going on for a long time, uh, and so there's usually no issue with students you know leaving uh, on the block schedule, being at the river for an hour, and getting back in time for their next class. That's not going to be possible now because they couldn't leave campus. Um, also, moving forward, you know, we learned a lot about what happens. You know, the tool that you use to build these collectors makes a big difference. Whether it's field maps or survey one, two, three, one allows you to see your where you are on the map. The other one doesn't. Um, so that could have some. And your final thoughts, Kirby. Your final yes. thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Uh, so implications on you know spatial understanding, and so you know that's kind of the project um, in a snapshot. And so here's if you want to follow up with me, my email, my website, um, you can probably find me on Twitter, or wherever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, thank you so much for the chance to present. Uh, I look forward to seeing questions uh, uh, when we're all done with all the, the different um, presentations. So thank you all very much. And I will hand it off to the next person. Very cool. All right. So next up, thank you, Kirby. Next up is going to be. Tom Hammond and a, uh, an associate, Trevor McDuff, with Around the World in 11 Days, a balloon, ham radio, and GIS in a STEM classroom. Take it away, Tom and Trevor. All right. Hello. All uh, right. Um, and Trevor, go ahead and say hello as well, please. And just tell us briefly where you are, because I'm at Lehigh yeah. University, very boring, blah, blah, blah. Uh, tell us about yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Trevor McDuff. Uh, I am a high school science teacher at Rivers Edge High School in southeastern Washington, Richland specifically. If you've heard of LIGO or Hanford, that's my backyard. All right. And uh, Trevor is the person who came up with this uh, activity that we're going to uh, walk you through. And it is the most 
creative original thing that I've ever seen. Um, and so I wanted to make sure that he could be part of uh, the discussion because you guys are going to ask a question. I'll be like, I don't know. Um, and definitely this has stretched the boundaries of, of my knowledge. Um, so our work is coming out of, uh, well, first let's just, you know, try to put these pieces uh, in, in conversation with each other. You might know what these four things are separately, balloons, ham radios, GIS, STEM classes, but when you put them all together, what does that look like? Well, it looks a little bit like this. Uh, there's Trevor on the right, and with an associate, he is launching uh, one of these balloons. And then it's got uh, stuff attached to it, and it's got a little iPad that it's going to be and uh, transmitting to. So roughly speaking, that's what it looks like in action in real life. But to kind of walk through the components, here's what we got. So uh, a teacher, let's call him Trevor, launches a mid-altitude weather balloon. Um, it has a solar-powered Pico satellite attached. And then that is itself a ham radio. Um, and it broadcasts as long as it's powered by you know, the sun. So at nighttime, it's going to go quiet. Um, and it gets picked up by other ham stations. And some of those stations will then feed their data uh, into APRSIS, the Automated Packet uh, Retrieval System Internet. Um, and so one of the outputs, for example, from that, there's a website, the APRS.FI is that screenshot right there. And um, then what we wanted to do is scrape that data and feed that into an ArcGIS map. So it would, it would pull in just uh, Trevor's balloon or other balloons um, or whatever else you wanted so that you would have that on a map that you could easily access and use with students. So you might say, that's a pretty cool thing to do, but why? What's the point of this? Now, in response to that, I would say, are you kidding? That's like the coolest thing I've ever heard of. It is its own you know, ontological imperative. We will do this because it is awesome. But okay, fine. I have to bring it into a K-12 school. We got to justify it. So I'd say start out by considering the data that we're getting out of this. Um, if you're getting the full data feed, there's some additional fields, but these are the fields that, that we wanted to use in capture. So uh, it's time stamped. Uh, we have a speed that the balloon is moving at. We have a course or heading at which it's going. Uh, we have an altitude and meters, uh, which satellite is tracking, voltage uh, that is currently getting generated through those solar panels. What is the temperature? Um, and then I don't know what the unknown field is doing out there. I assume some piece of metadata um, that didn't get used. Um, so with this data, we could say, okay, we might investigate a whole bunch of things. So for example, um, if nothing else, we could be looking at measures of central tendency. So what was the, what's the mean median range of the balloon's altitude, for example? Uh, we could look at relationships between these different fields. So what does the voltage look like over time? And it's gonna go up in the daytime and it's gonna go flat at nighttime, for example. Uh, we could look at a scatter plot of temperature versus altitude. Uh, we could look at correlations that uh, as you get up into higher latitudes uh, for the time of year um, that this balloon was up, that uh, you should be getting um, uh, higher temperatures um, or altitude and temperature. The higher up you go, the colder it's going to get. Um, anyway, so lots of different things can be investigated uh, from this data set that the, uh, the balloon and its satellite will generate. Um, it's also, more importantly, a demonstration of global wind patterns. So this is a little tricky, and Trevor, correct me when I get it wrong, but uh, your balloon was launched uh, October 9th of this past year. Um, and then it's, you know, drifted off to the east and then, then it was nighttime. And so the balloon yep. is off the grid. So we lose like that last data point you see right there. Um, and then you see that straight line. That's because during the night, the balloon went somewhere. We don't know where. And then at dawn of the next day, once it's powered up and it's broadcasting and there's this, a ham radio station to pick it up, it's now, you know, just made it up by the Canadian border, drifts a little bit further north into Canada. Then it's nighttime. So you can you get the idea. It works its way um, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, based on the angle at which you see it coming down off the west coast of Ireland, you know, we can infer that, huh, maybe it was starting out from way further north. Did it come down over Iceland? Did it pass over Greenland? Um, it then makes its way, dips through the Mediterranean, wouldn't we all like to, uh, then heads off uh, towards uh, West Asia. And then it goes all the way across. Um, there's a long dark period and until some, it hits. The, yeah, go ahead. Part of that dark period across Kazakhstan and China is because they don't have the repeaters. It's not necessarily that it was going super fast. They yes. have the APRS repeaters listening there. Mm -hmm. 
That's correct. Uh, then it leaves the Sea of Japan, or sorry, it's picked up in the Sea of Japan. And then we get one of these GIS errors in which, well, not an error, but just you have to understand that it's wrapping. It's actually continues to go west, but the GIS display is wrapping that data um, all the way back um, to you know, like the beginning of the next day. It's being picked up um, someplace over, I forget if that's in uh, Montana or if it made it to Wyoming or whatever. Anyway, it eventually comes down in Omaha. Uh, so it took 11 days to circle the globe, okay? But it's not like it, it's a straight line at the same latitude, right? There's some wandering north and south uh, to make it there. Uh, so this is all dictated by the weather pattern. The balloon doesn't drive itself, it just follows the wind. So we can then compare that against uh, predicted models. So for example, this is the, uh, the high split trajectory model from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It's pretty close. Okay, like we definitely got this something that went further north um, over the Atlantic. Um, but, you know, we did cross the center of the Mediterranean and we did hit East Asia and we can make a guess now at what happened in that zone where there weren't many repeaters, et cetera. So pretty close to the projected model. So from this, things that we could talk about with students also include all the technologies that are involved. So if I go backwards across this, like that whole concept of weather system modeling, and then the GIS that we're using to look at it, the Python scripting that was used to scrape the, uh, the APRSIS data and get it into the GIS, um, important in function of uh, call signs, because this balloon has a call sign that uh, allows us to track it through the database. That whole idea of automated reporting and, and repeaters um, and sensors, distributed networks, all these things are happening to make this experiment possible. And this is something that you know, students can be pretty hands-on with, that uh, they can participate with the balloon launch, they can uh, be watching the data as it comes in and then be hands-on with the data once they have it. All right, then. Sorry, just checking my time. Um, this event got started uh, in part due to the Smithsonian. Um, there was a live balloon launch. So there are actually multiple balloons being launched on that same day of October 9th. Um, there were a total of 10 balloons. Um, and so these are the other balloons that you can see. I just zoomed in a little bit more of the map, showed their call signs. Uh, but you can see that Trevor is the only balloon who really caught these uh, those globe circling winds uh, due to his higher latitude. And also you had good weather conditions on that day. Right, that there is somebody else launching from Alaska who I think was like, you know, fogged out or something, couldn't launch. I, I used a, a, a high pressure balloon. They used um, a Mylar party balloon. It's a little cheaper um, mm -hmm. right for a, a couple of days. Mine was designed for su sustained altitude. Okay. So I guess that also helps to, uh, to get a, the kind of equipment that can go around the globe and not just a celebrated birthday party. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Okay, um, so if you wanna learn more about it, there's Trevor's contact information, there's my contact information. Uh, we need to give a special shout out to Tom Baker of Esri, who I think was in here because he's the person who handled all the Python scripting for us. And so any questions you wanna ask us about that, we're going to throw that right along to Tom Baker and say, we'll let you handle this one. Right. Very cool, excellent. And thank you. Now let me go ahead and shift again. Thanks, Tom and Trevor. That was uh, that was fun. And uh, we'll complete our world adventure uh, going back in time. Even uh, this is a GIS journey from archaeology to education with Bronwyn Terrell. Bronwyn, if you're ready, I'm gonna throw you the screen. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, let me get this pulled up. And yes. We can see it. Perfect. Click the present. There we go. All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Bronwyn Terrell and I'm a fourth grade teacher from Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, and the research that I'm going to be presenting on is from my time at William & Mary um, in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, in this presentation, we're going to explore the journey from archaeology to education through GIS. Um, creating data for an archaeology project in French Polynesia sounds about as far away uh, from a fourth grade classroom as possible, yet it provides K-12 students with opportunities to think spatially and educators with opportunities for lifelong learning. Um, this was my first year teaching. And it was quite an adventure of a year, um, finding student and teacher engagement in the wake of global trauma and uncertainty, um, specifically 
virtually, <laughs> uh, is a challenge that is unique to our current time and space. Um, and through the science of where I was able to discover ways of engaging both students and teachers. So to start us off, let's talk about some archaeology. Um, I came to the GIS world almost by accident. I was in my last semester of undergraduate and on a whim decided to take a course titled GIS for Archaeology. Um, this course was designed as a way to introduce ESRI technology into archaeological practices for mapping modern sites and visualizing their past lives. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with an amazing mentor who trusted me with her data sets and was able to create the geo database for the region that she is studying. Um, that's the Apunahu Valley on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. The Apunahu Valley has a complex settlement pattern with clusters of ceremonial structures and house sites. Among these various ceremonial sites include nine temples constructed out of stone, each with an upraised altar. Oral traditions and histories, historic records recount how some trees had sacred meanings to pre-contact Tahitian communities, uh, given their specialized use in religious ceremonies or used for manufacturing religious sacra. We examine the distribution of tree types in the valley, differentiating sacred trees from economically useful trees, and exploring their spatial association with temple sites, specialized house sites, and residential sites. We began with visualizing the distribution of trees in the valley to see how many sacred trees were near temple sites and if there were any outliner, outliers. The Apunahu Valley is located in the northern middle section of Morea. That's what those green dots are on the screen right now. Um, and this valley is one of the oldest agricultural areas on the island. In addition to thousands of agricultural terraces and hundreds of residential sites, it also contains several large ceremonial centers replete with temples, shrines, and administrative structures such as rectangular council meeting platforms. So that's just a little bit about the area, area of study that we looked at during this process. Uh, now the important part, the trees. Uh, there are several different types of trees found in the valley. Here we focus on the five taxa that pre-contact Tahitian communities have exploited for various sacred and secular purposes, um, such as for firewood, for raw materials used to construct houses, for medicinal purposes, and for manufacturing canoes. In addition, several species were considered sacred by pre-contact Tahitians and had ritual use, such as this banyan um, that's listed at the top of the um, chart to the left. Um, historic documents suggest such trees may have been planted close to temple sites um, intentionally. To test this, we looked at tree counts, which clarify that sacred trees are quite rare, um, which meets the expectations for a highly valued resource. We also examined spatial locations of trees of tree types to determine whether certain species were overwhelmingly associated with temple structures or were associated with other types of archaeological sites. Our preliminary analysis shows that the banyan trees are correlated with temple sites, while tier eri trees or candle nut trees are associated with both specialized houses and domestic sites. So now we'll talk about visualizing the data. Um, when mapping the valley, we began with geo-referencing a PDF of a site map. Um, that's this down in the bottom left corner. And we were able to use UTM coordinate points to achieve an accuracy of two meters. Um, we discovered this through ground truthing with GPS points when my mentor was able to go back to Morea and um, walk the paths that were on our site map. Um, from there, we projected everything else into the UTM coordinate system of Morea 1987, which is actually now going to be reprojected into a more recent UTM system. Um, following this, over 1,600 trees were digitized by hand onto our base map. Um, we then discovered that we were able to scan the PDF map directly into the geo database to gain even more accuracy. Once we were able to scan the map in using ArcScan, we were able to digitize all of our contour lines and create more accurate tree points and placements of the different structures of the map. The digitized contour lines can be seen in the top right corner. The majority of this project up until this time has been building an accurate and complete geo database for the valley. Uh, now that our geo database is set with two meter accuracy for trees and buildings, um, and our trees are all in the right place thanks to ArcScan, um, our next step is to start moving on to the analysis. We'll be running a statistical analysis of the trees similar to a nearest neighbor function in order to determine whether certain tree types are in fact closer to specific structures. Um, oops, and that's this right here. Um, so some of that has been run already and you can see that 
these purple squares here are our temples. Um, and you can see that specific trees are located um, more centrally and some of them are farther away. So this one here where my mouse is, um, these are our banyans. And so the banyans are closer to, they're within one ceremonial complex. And then we have our outlier over here that's not as close as we were hoping, but hopefully is near a um, shrine. Uh, so we're using more of this near analysis um, and creating our um, event layers in order to hopefully prove that what we've been seeing so far just based on um, first look is true. Um, from this experience, I learned that flexibility, confidence, and a desire for learning are the most important skills any researcher can have, which takes me into my section about education because the same can be said for educators as well. So um, this research at first appears to have nothing to do with teaching fourth grade. And in fact, in the state of Virginia, we have to follow our standards of learning. And so this research content wise literally has nothing to do with what I taught in fourth grade. Um, however, I firmly believe that I would not have been able to be a successful educator in this year of hybrid learning experiences without these GIS um, tools um, and the experience of the research itself. So as a brand new first year teacher, I had all of these grand plans of what I was going to incorporate into my lesson. And as um, um, Tom and Trevor and Kirby have all said, COVID really kind of threw a wrench into to some plans this year. Um, but I had all of these plans on the lessons I was going to incorporate, the technology I was going to utilize. And at the top of my list were Esri story maps and survey one, two, threes. Um, for fourth grade, that seems like a daunting task to take on. Um, but after seeing what they can do with technology this year, um, I'm looking forward to next year and utilizing them more efficiently within the classroom. Um, and as anyone who is in the field of education or knows someone who's in the field of education knows this year was a year of survival. So a lot of these plans kind of went out the window rather quickly when I was learning the ropes of dealing with a pandemic. Um, teaching as a first year teacher and ensuring that all of my students were receiving the supports that they needed. Um, though this year was all about surviving for me, I learned three very important takeaways that will help me thrive in my second year of teaching and all of them tie back to my experiences with GIS. The first is flexibility is key. On the job thinking and problem solving make up probably 90% of teaching. Um, and this is true for working in GIS as well. I remember when I was first putting the trees into our base map, um, I was convinced that I needed to complete a task in this very specific way in Arc Pro that I did not need to do. It took me four hours to complete it the way that I thought it needed to be done, and it still didn't have the end result that I had hoped for. Um, then I did some Googling, and the solution came to me within a matter of minutes, as it often does. Um, the same can be said for a lesson plan that is not just not engaging your students the way you think it will. Um, thinking critically while teaching a lesson, much like thinking critically while making a map, can take a lesson from just the content the students need to know to an engaging experience that they will never forget. Um, one day early on in the year when we were still completely virtual, my students were learning about Virginia natural resources and teaching that over Zoom is not the most entertaining way to teach. Um, usually we go outside and, or from what I was told, we usually go outside and we explore the woods around us and talk about um, the resources in a firsthand way. Um, and so being over Zoom and trying to explain this to them, I could tell I was losing them. And so I pulled out a 20 minute GIS lesson that my professor had shared with me about where our breakfasts come from. Um, and we talked about what we'd had for breakfast and they were more than excited to tell me all about their bacon and their hash browns that they'd had. Um, and then when we looked at the interactive map, we tried to figure out exactly where our food might have come from, um, specifically within the state of Virginia. They had so much fun realizing that their bacon likely came from just around the corner from us in Smithfield, Virginia, and that their cereal may have been made from grains that were grown in the Piedmont region. Um, I had students who were still talking about this lesson on our last day of school, almost nine months after we had completed this lesson. Um, engagement. So students thrive, as all of us know as educators, students thrive when you give them agency over their learning. Even in my college courses, I know that I was more engaged when I had some say in what I was going to be studying, which is why my Morea project has carried over the past three years. Um, 
This is true in a pedagogical sense for all of education. Students tune in when they know what they're, why what they're learning about is important, and even more so if they feel like they're taking ownership over their learning, allowing them to play a key part, key and active part in their um, and engaging them in different ways to now to. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, to activate their prior knowledge is important. And utilizing story maps, I found, was a great way this year um, with some pre-made ones about the American Revolution. We had a great time with that. And so I can only imagine what next year is going to look like when I have them create their own um, story maps about the American Revolution. And finally, lifelong learning. Um, teachers have to be lifelong learners. As educators, part of our job is to never stop learning and evolving. If we intend to keep our students learning and engaged, then we have to set the example. Um, GIS and spatial thinking allows students to gain awareness of the world around them. And it allows teachers to activate their prior knowledge, prior knowledge in students in a way that hasn't been overworked in the classroom yet. Um, I know when I, was brought into my current role. Um, all of these teachers were telling me about how they activate prior knowledge and um, thinking through ways that would make make it more exciting and fun was a really, um, it was a challenge, but it's also something I'm really looking forward to next year because just using, um, yeah. Um, so GIS is always evolving and so it provides ample opportunities for professional development. Um, that is enjoyable and practical. When I would talk with my students this year about how I was still in school and to learn about map making, they were so excited and wanted to know everything about it. Um, and in order to keep them interested, I would oftentimes use that as a um, a mind a mind break where we would talk about what I was learning instead of what they were learning. Um, so I'm seeing Charlie's face. So I'm assuming my time is up, but thank you so much if you I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes next year. If you have any questions, here is my email. Bronwyn, I think that uh, everybody will agree that we all think uh, from your lips to the education departments in every college and university across the land, across the continents. Okay. Uh, thank you, presenters. It's now we get time. So presenters, put Put your uh, cameras back up here. This is, uh, we wanna see you and hear you because we've had some wonderful presentations and uh, people have had a lot of comments. And uh, so I wanna start with uh, Kirby. Maybe you've been able to uh, dance through the ants and uh, <laughs> make sure that you're uh, comfortable. Are there any yeah. things that you have seen in the chat stream that you wanted to address? Um, and I'll ask the same thing for Tom and then Bronwyn as well. You know, the main thing I saw in the chat screen that uh, from my presentation kind of was regarding the uh, formulas used to convert from one GIS, I guess one uh, geo coordinate to another. Um, and so Tom kind of answered that, uh, but basically uh, that was kind of the, the main thing is you just split the data into three columns and then you have to convert it from a base 60 to a base 10 and then put it all back together and make sure that you have the positives and negatives correct so that you know, you're not on the opposite end of the globe. Um, and so uh, I'll look through here quickly and see if there was anything else regarding mine. Well, as you as you're looking, yeah, uh, let's see if Tom and Trevor have some uh, uh, comments that you guys want to address, and and for everybody else, keep adding questions or comments in the messaging in the chat. Uh, well, if we had had more time, we wanted to show a website called uh, Null School um, that just lets you um, model. Uh, global wind patterns. So that's another like sort of output. If I can share my screen real briefly, um, that this is sort of like close to the surface level winds. And then um, we can say this is about the altitude at which um, Trevor's balloon was working. Um, so this, this gives, in addition to like the high split static model, this is a way to sort of have a dynamic look at the, um, at, uh, what's, what's going on um as the wind moves around so i just wanted to share that yeah and i bill, bill just popped a question in the chat about how, how do we get the data there um 
uh, when you say a typical earth science teacher can't pull it off, I mean, I, I think you can. I, and, I, and I'd love to help you with that. Shoot me an email and we'll, we'll talk offline. But as far as getting the data, APRS, um, I, I, again, we went to the, the fabulous Tom Baker. Um, and he was able to, he, he put a Python script into the APRS and just kind of pulled that data out each day, um, just kind of did a data dump. And so, um, yeah, send, send, send me your, send me your email. Um, and I will, I'll, I'll go through and find my spreadsheet on that and I'll, I've done other balloon launches since then. And I'm working with the local museum now to try to put another one together. And so, um, yeah, if we can, I, I love keeping this going. Um, but no, I, I would love, I, I would love to help you, uh, launch your balloon and see how this actually can work in your own classroom. Cause I feel like I'm just a typical science teacher too. So. And we will be looking to write this up and uh, get this out. Uh, the work that, that, that Trevor has been doing with us and also Kirby's work, uh, we're part of a larger uh, grants um, that's working on. Uh, so, for example, Kate Popejoy is here. She's one of the other PIs in the grant. Doug Leeson is a doc student working with us. So uh, we have other teachers we're working with across the country. And we have a science teacher, for example, in Pennsylvania who wants to replicate this because, like everybody, he saw it and said, that's really cool. How do I do this? So we hope to uh, actually have that experience of directly working with some other folks to get them up and rolling. And we'll be sure to uh, publicize and uh, get out information about how to do it. Um, because not everybody can reach out to the, the wonderful folks like Charlie and Tom at Esri. Um, I mean, you can, but first you gotta, you gotta know that you can first. Um, so yeah, we wanna try to find a way to make this a smooth process for other people to get involved. Okay, and uh, thanks for that ad. Uh, Bronwyn, are there items that you want to address? I am. I just saw a question from Allison about um, a link. I'm going to put that in the chat for you. And then um, Bill said he had a really great quote from Mark Twain that I just really appreciated. <laughs> 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 well, that was a great, that was an uh, astonishing uh way to interpret your first year and uh, wonderful, delightful. Um, and so uh, one of the things that you guys, I'll take a, a little minute of privilege here. There is a hub that uh, Tom Baker uh, coordinates. It is a geo projects hub. And if you've got projects like these that you are interested in having um, displayed somewhere or uh, want to pass them on to other teachers and don't necessarily know where to go with it, uh, get in touch with Tom Baker. Uh, and you can just send it to schools at esri.com and Tom is on that list as well. And uh, we'll, we'll help you with that because what we're trying to do is to, is to let people see all these different projects, ways that they can do this. And Bronwyn, you should know that there have been fourth graders who have been up on stage at the Esri User Conference plenary uh, presenting their GIS activities in front of thousands of people. Uh, so this is, uh, you're, you're a good candidate for uh, thinking about that for next year. Uh, other comments, uh, Kirby or Tom and Trevor. Um, no, I don't think so. I'll look at the chat one more time. Okay. Uh, it, it, anybody who is looking to replicate the, uh, the mid-altitude balloons, one of, one of the key things, though, is you have to have a ham radio license. And so that's why, you know, I'm KS1 LAS, and that's, um, that, that's on the contact page that Tom shared. So... That, that is one of the key things. If you have a ham radio license, um, great. Go find a teacher who you can do this with. If you're a teacher and you're looking for a ham radio license, the ham community is hugely supportive of things like this. And so, um, and your technician license um, is, is pretty accessible. I, I, I was able to get through it, you know, a week of study and I was done. So um, anyhow, yeah, it, it's a phenomenal tool and uh, encourage ham radios. Wow. Um, and I just saw, saw a comment from yep. Shannon White about geo mentors. And so I think it's the same thing. Just as you can almost always find somebody to help you through GIS, the ham radio community, just, just reach out. There will be people who will want to get involved and help you. 
Well, okay, everybody who is in the audience, go ahead and turn on your cameras and clap for our <laughs> presenters today because holy cow, these were three outstanding presentations. And I just want to thank all three uh, communities here and people from across the country and around the world watching these things. Great job. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward to the next session. So you got 15 minutes to get to the next session. And one more time, I'm going to share a screen. And uh, let's see, I got to hit the right button here, Charlie. Don't don't uh, don't go way too far here on this. Let me back out of this presentation and say your two key links for finding things are the page that Rosemary, thank you, Rosemary, put together this top one. And then there are some uh, items of interest at this hub site down below. Thank you all. We'll see you in the next session, wherever Thanks, it is. everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wow, Bronwyn, that was extraordinary. Uh, Thank you so much. Interpretation of the life as a teacher in the first year. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, and I'm also just to chime in, I'm excited to see somebody bring geospatial work from higher ed into K-12 because it is yeah. very rare that that happens. It's like we have a course at Lehigh, with, it's a teacher ed course about using GIS in the classroom, but you made that jump with at, like you just had GIS exposure and then you you bridged that gap yourself. There are very few teachers who do that. Like I've, <laughs> I've, I've been teaching social studies teachers for almost 20 years and I could probably count on, on one hand, how many teachers I've met who have been like, oh yeah, I, I, I ran into Google Earth and then I figured out how to use it and now I use it in my classroom. They always need somebody to like show them, cajole them, yeah. et cetera. So that's awesome. That's definitely been my, thank you. Um, it's definitely been my experience. We don't even have, so I was trying to get it so that my students could start this year with creating their own maps um, because we do have mapping as one of our standards of learning. Um, and I thought, what better way to teach it than to show them how to make one, either mm -hmm. with ArcGIS online or with story maps or whatever it may be. And uh, <clears throat> and so I was working on that, and then I found out my district doesn't even have the Esri license. Um, like they so haven't can, even applied for it yet. For so one. that's what we're working on for this this summer. Is okay. I'm working with the TIS and trying to get us set up for it. Okay. I yeah. mean, if you, if you want to skip the line. Yeah, skip the line, talk to Tom and, and Charlie, and because uh, they would like you to sign up at a school yes. level. If, if you're thinking a district level, then you know exactly. you, can, you can duck out of that if you wish. Cool, so well Thank done. You. And uh, I hope to see you at another ESRI conference uh, or, or maybe cross paths at William & Mary that Shannon White and the, uh, the GIS team down there are great. Yes. And they've been very okay. helpful with us for, uh, for other topics that we've been thinking about doing, so. Um, keep the faith, keep doing what you're doing. This whole project. <laughs> yeah, she's wonderful. Thank you. All right. Take care.